Hello, my name is Linda Slootweg of the University of Applied Sciences in Utrecht. And in this PowerPoint presentation, I want to tell you about pain in general and the influence of mental processes on the experience of pain. So let's talk about pain. We all experience it every now and then, some more than others. When I talk about pain in this presentation, I use the following definition. Pain is an adversive sensory and emotional experience typically caused by, or resembling that caused by, actual or potential tissue injury. Two things are important here. One, it's a sensory and emotional experience. And two, it could also resemble being caused by possible injury. Today, I'll focus on the cognitive and affective or emotional part of pain. I assume you are familiar with the biopsychosocial model in thinking about health in general, especially in understanding pain. It's a coherent and useful model to understand and approach a pain problem, knowing that, for instance, perceived control, catastrophic thinking and mood disorders like depression and anxiety have great impact on pain experience. That's why I want to address the topic of mental health in relation to pain experience to you today. Another model that's commonly used in physiotherapy is the International Classification of Function, or ICF. It shows that health condition has mutual impact on bodily factors, activity and participation as contextual factors. So in treating patients, we need to address both. Focusing on the biopsychosocial model, Evidence shows that patients with pain on several locations have higher risk on the development, relapse and a worse course of depressive and anxiety disorders, even if they did not show any depressive symptoms yet. But vice versa, people with depression or anxiety disorders are two to three times more likely to suffer from physical complaints such as muscle and joint pain, heart and respiratory complaints and intestinal stomach complaints. So how does it work? If we look at the history of pain research, we started with the assumption that pain was a symptom of underlying pathology. Bonica started to put pain on the agenda as a topic of its own. In the early 60s, Leuser published this like onion layer model, where the biopsychosocial pain management approach and behavioral approach was added, showing that irrespective of any anatomic physiologic event, behavior, doing and saying, can be influenced. In the late 60s, Melzuk and Wall introduced the gate control theory, stating that psychological variables can moderate and mediate pain. I'll tell more about that later. In the 80s, we got the fear avoidance model that showed a cognitive behavioral approach with focus on beliefs, appraisals and coping. The aim, regain control over the effects of pain. At this moment, we look at pain as a situation that acquires psychological flexibility, where observable, modifiable psychological factors support healthy functioning, like mentioned in the ICF model. The healthy functioning is the goal to achieve. Up to recently, we focused on fear as the explanatory mechanism for sensitization and limitations. In treatment, there was a strong role for recognizing and re-evaluating conscious thoughts. The items like fear avoiding hypervigilance somatization were of interest in clinical reasoning. The downside of that approach was that the broad, broad motivational context is missing and it encourages psychopathologizing. The more recent point of view is the cognitive load theory. Pain urges people to interrupt ongoing activity. It elicits protective responses, responses that paradoxically increase interference with daily life activities and comprises the sense of self, the identity. So the goals people have that 
determine their behavior to achieve those goals is highly influenced by the pain experience. They can't do what they want to do to achieve their goals. Here's an example. If pain occurs, it gives an interruption in action, like coordination, walking, lifting. This leads to an interference in their daily life activities, for instance, playing basketball. But playing basketball can be really important for someone's daily life. They feel um, happy in their team, they feel being healthy, they can be active, it's a part of their identity. And if this interruption of not being able to, to walk or run leads to uh, this interference and less playing basketball, it has influence on their identity. This is presented as the cognitive load theory by Smith, Ayers and Vlyen. It says that pain limits capacity of the working memory and pain erupts ongoing activities. Looking at the cognitive load theory using the fear avoidance model, it starts with the nociception that leads to pain when there's a distinction whether it's threatening or not. If priority is set to pain control, it leads to fear, avoidance and negative effects, with co which causes more pain experience and so on. Looking at the cognitive load theory, we start with an uncontrolled stimuli, pain. It leads to an interruption, selective attention, and a positive escape. So far, so good. But when there's also a controlled stimulus, then assumptions occur. When it's neutral, there's nothing wrong. But when it's not, it can lead to fear, avoidance, and safety seeking, which leads to interference. If generalization stimuli are added, the effect or interference increases with more fear, more avoidance and more safety seeking. It's the idea that I just have bad or weak knees. Those are generalization stimuli. Let's take an example. The basketball player falls hard to the ground. The uncontrolled stimuli stimuli of pain occurs. Immediately there are controlled stimuli such as my left leg is prone to injury, this basketball floor is always very slippery, or badly maintained, my team will be very disappointed, this opponent is always very rough on me, all these things together determine his behavior. Very simply put, the controlled stimuli, earlier described as observable, modifiable psychological factors, determine the behavior of the basketball player laying on the ground. In a nutshell, there's pain which leads to interruption that causes uh, subconscious faults and beliefs may lead to fear avoidance, safety seeking, which has, which causes interference, which influ influences identity and effective problems may occur. And especially the fear avoidance and safety seeking and the effective problems are very important to address when we need, uh, when we um, treat patients with pain. And of course, as early said, the effective problems influence pain on its own. So we have like a vicious circle where the patient is in. Also in the common sense model of self-regulation, it shows that cognitions and emotions create an interference 
and determine coping and thereby influence illness outcomes. We see the same in the avoidance endurance model from Hasenbrink. The catastrophizing, the thought suppression and the distraction all leads to the possible development of chronic, in this case, low back pain, but chronic pain. The th salt suppression can lead to depressive moods, endurance behavior and muscular overload. Catastrophizing leads to fear and anxiety, avoidance behavior and insufficiency and so on. So much for theory. What do we check when we treat patients with pain? Of course, we do the general anamnesis, but besides that, it's very important to look at the cognitions a patient has. So are there any certain events that influence the pain or complaints? And if the patient talks about the complaints, what does it think about it? Are they concerned? And what do you expect from treatments? These are all questions we need to ask all patients who, goes, who, who come into our practice. And when we check the effects, we ask the questions, what emotions do you experience? Is there any anger or sadness or anxiety? Do you experience problems in concentration? Are you more emotional lately? And why are you sharing this? Is there any particular with it? Sometimes people feel a bit, um, um, they, they don't get, uh, answer the questions about emotions that easily because they think it's crazy or a stupid thing to say, but do ask if there's any um, reason why they share their, the, the experience they do share. Because sometimes there's an underlying emotion that they don't want to express right away and also for you as a physiotherapist don't feel any uh, embarrassment on asking these questions it depends on your culture if it's if it's really easy and uh, everyday uh, practice to ask those questions and sometimes it's not but it's really important to do so if you want to treat your patients well and um, uh, include all possible factors of this um, pain experience. So what kind of questionnaires can you use? Of course, cognition based, like the pain catastrophizing skill, fear avoidance beliefs questionnaire, illness perceptions questionnaires, and so on. These are good options, but also the emotion based questionnaires are very important to use, as I mentioned before. And it could it's not just this list. There are several uh, emotion-based questionnaires you can use. Just look in the databases and see which one fits your client best. So just look at a case. Um, it's a chronic low back pain patient just uh, going in, uh, in primary care. And it has a referral by a rehabilitation physician with chronic low back pain due to severe spondylolysis in uh, lumbar four, lumbar stenosis with radiation to the legs, muscle weakness, muscle weakness, and is placed on rehab waiting list. Medication is amitriptyline. The patient is a female of 63 years old, married, mother of two children, and she lives in France for six months per year. The low back pain started about 40 years ago and orthoped orthopedic surgery is not possible. So if we look at a patient like this, we of course we ask about their somatic, somatic complaints. In this case, constant uh, low back pain, which increases during standing and walking. But we also ask about the cognitive uh, uh, complaint, how she experiences her um, uh, her pain and what she thinks is wrong and here she states i shouldn't complain just continue and see what happens she has a negative self-esteem i can't bother others and will i end in a wheelchair 
so she's also afraid. In France, I feel better, she says, so I must be crazy and or overreacting. It's very good to hear those uh, responses because we can act on them. And her emotions were fear of pain, loss of losing control and feelings of guilt because she can't do what people expect from her. She's angry at her body and she's blaming herself. Due to this cognitive, um, uh, how do you say it? These assumptions of her and her emotions, her behavior leads to pushing herself to do a lot and not showing her pain. So she's um, overusing her body. Looking at the patient's goal, the, she wants to function normally despite her back problem. And if we look at the, the impression of the first examination, her, um, there are no, the, the, the active range of motion is a bit down, straight leg raise positive, and uh, she has difficulty walking and difficulty standing. So mod what kind of model would you use in your physical therapy situation? And what kind of model would you want your students to use? And how do you determine the interference in life of this patient due to her pain experience? And what questionnaires and what testing is good to use in this kind of situations? And what do you want your students to use? And what's the minimum required knowledge of the student? What do they need to know about the influence of this interference on their identity and this influence of um, mental situations like um, fear, like depression, and the influence of those on uh, the pain experience? Altogether, how about mental health in treating patients with pain? So I think it's very important that it's integrated in every uh, physical therapy education curriculum and that the skills and communication and clinical reasoning around this, these patients and the influence of mental health is stressed. So the theories and models in approaching of pain, addressing mental health is implemented. That's how, how I feel about mental health. And I hope uh, the, the inf uh, how I feel about the influence of mental health. And I hope that by um, listening to my uh, presentation, you are um, you understand the importance of it, and you are willing to to see if you can uh, if we can change thinking about mental health in our um, care as physiotherapists. Okay, I, th I know you can't ask any questions as I'm now presenting to my laptop, but of course you can send questions to linda.slotweg at hu.nl. That's my email address and I'm very uh, welc uh, welcome to answer your questions if you have any. So thank you very much for your attention and maybe see you later. Have a nice day.